Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about data collection method and constant time delay method. After you set your objective for your student, and as you teach the student to learn that objective, you want to measure if your student reach that goal you set. So we want to collect data on the student's behavior and progress on that objective you set for your student. So we, we have to choose the matching data collection system, which means when you look at your objective, the criteria part in your objective will tell you which data collection method you can use. Let's look at this example. When presented with a set of up to 10 manipulatives, Monica will count the amount correctly with 100% accuracy in 4 out of 5 triers. For this objective, you may want to use percentage system to collect data on B Monica's behavior, right? Because it already tells you to use percentage, right? So your objective will tell you which data collection methods you can go with. Also, your data collection methods are affected by the type of behaviors. Last week, we talked about the different types of behavior. Discrete behavior means, um, discrete behavior involves a single isolated response with an, on, uh, with an obvious beginning and end. Chain behavior consists of many behaviors, many discrete behaviors chained together in sequence. If you're focusing on a student's discrete behavior, it is easy to measure. As you're measuring only one behavior, simple, you can just take a look at your criteria and your objective, and you can measure that criteria as the objective indicated. In this case, you definitely want to use percentage. If your target behavior is a chained behavior, you have to do the task analysis first, which means you have to do some analysis on your objective and put the chained behavior in order as you see in this slide. This is another example of chained behavior. You see, for this chained behavior, the task analysis may consist of the six steps in order. Then you may want to create a table like this and you move the steps of behavior in the left side. You see the six steps and you can collect data on the steps of behavior daily. And as you see in this table, September 4th, Spencer had 0% correct. How this teacher marked Spencer's behavior was the teacher marked minus sign as incorrect response for the step plus sign as correct response for the step and zero as no response for the step. So on September 4th, Spencer did not respond to step one through step five and for step six, Spencer made incorrect response, right? So the percentage of, percentage of correct response for the day was zero. However, the next day, September 5th, Spencer made one correct response, one correct response to step three, which made 17% correct for the day. How you compute the percentage of correct is you can divide the number of the correct response by the total number of steps multiply by 100, then you can get the percentage of correct. So these are the data collection systems we often use at school. Event recording include frequency, rate, and percentage, latency, duration, interval recording, and time sampling. But there are infinite ways uh, that data collection sheets can be set up. I uploaded some sample data sheets you can use. Make sure you modify the data sheets as you need. Let's take a look at each data collection system now. 
So the first one is frequency. Frequency is easy because you can just simply count the behavior, how many times the behavior within specified time. So uh, important thing you have to remember is when you use frequency, you have to set the observation time and the observation time should be identical through session which means if you observe the behavior 10 minutes for 10 minutes today the next day should be 10 minutes as well the next day 10 minutes so the observation time should be identical identical through uh, the sessions and within that uh, 10 minute the the period the observation period you set you will observe how many times the target behavior you want to observe occur uh, so you can simply use tally marks um, you can use frequency for the behavior that is uniform in length like hitting um, you should not use frequency for the behavior that occurs for a long period like hand waving tantrum So this is a sample data sheets you can use for frequency. You see the table in the middle and you write down the starting time and stop time. And then you can simply use tally marks uh, whenever you see that behavior and then you can get the total for the observation. So this sheet is used when your target behavior is chained behavior. You need to uh, write down the steps first, then put the date on the top. Then you can circle uh, the steps if the child could complete those steps independently. And you can cross out some steps if the student needs uh, any help on the steps or a uh, student cannot perform the steps in independently. Then finally, you can count the total number of uh, circled step and you can get the percentage um, out of the total number of steps you have. So rate is to calculate the frequency of behavior and its relationship to time. You will know how many times the behavior occurs in one minute or five minutes or ten minutes as you said. You can use it when your observation time varies across sessions. For example, first day you have 30 minutes for observation. Next day you, can, uh, you have 20 minutes and the next day you have 15 minutes. So when your observation time rate, uh, when your observation time varies, rate is helpful. Um, to use rate, you have to uh, mark both frequency of behavior occurred and your observation time for the session. So you can calculate rate. If you see the table at the bottom, um, that's the example. So let's say you're concerning about your students uh, burping, the student burp so frequently. So you want to get that data. Then uh, you know that you can only have two minutes for day one, for your observation day two you have only four minutes when your observation time varies you can use rate right so day one the student birth six times within two minutes so you can get the rate six um, divided by two so you know that the student birth three times per minute for day one the next day student birth for 14 times uh, in four minutes and then you can get that rate. So you see 3.5 times per minute for day two. So you can report your data in this way when you use rate. And this is a sample rate data summary sheets. You can download it from Blackboard. So duration is easy. Duration is a length of time. Uh, behavior occurs within specified periods. So if you are measuring students out of seat behavior, then you can use a stopwatch and you can start the stopwatch when student stands up and goes away and you can stop the stopwatch when student comes back and sit down. So that will be the duration of uh, the students out of seat behavior. So this is a sample duration recording sheets. Of course, you can modify as you need.
Latency and durations are similar because they are measuring the length of time. But latency is different because latency is the length of time between presentation of SD and the initiation of the behavior. So some children at school, they are showing, uh, they are having a hard time for transitioning. Teachers say something, then they do not want to perform, right? Um, so that is a good example of latency. We want to reduce the time between teacher's direction and student's behavior, right? Another good example at the bottom, uh, given the SD, teacher saying, everyone take out a pencil. How long does it take for the student to start taking out a pencil? We want to reduce the time between SD, teacher's direction, and the student's uh, behavior. So that will be the latency. So this is a sample data recording sheets for latency. Latency data recording sheets and uh, duration recording sheets are similar because they're measuring the similar thing. So the next one is interval recording. To use interval recording system, observer needs to divide an observation session into short equal intervals. And the occurrence of the behavior within each interval is recorded. Let's say the observation time is 5 minutes. Then you divide the observation time into short equal intervals like 10 seconds. Um, these sheets use 10 second interval. You see, first six boxes for the first, ten mi uh, first one minute because they are using uh, 10 second intervals. And interval systems has uh, two systems. The first one is whole interval system. They record whether a behavior occurs continuously within a specified interval like for 10 seconds so uh, you can use this whole interval for continuous behavior like that uh, the behavior happening for a long time like on task or out of seat or uh, tantrums like screaming so if the students uh, screams for like 10 seconds like ah for 10 seconds without any stopping point, then you will mark that interval as occurrence. The second, second uh, system is called partial interval. They record whether a behavior occurs at any time within a specified interval, uh, like 10 second interval. Um, so you can use partial interval for any behavior uh, within the 10 second interval. If behavior happen multiple times, it doesn't matter. You are going to just mark that interval as uh, occurrence. That's it, okay? This is a sample data sheet. Let's say the teacher used partial interval system and observed Diego's, uh, Diego's talk out during science class. The teacher used 10 second interval and the total observation time as you see was five minutes. And as this is a partial interval recording, the teacher observed if Diego's talk out occurred any moment within each 10 second interval. And the teacher marked T as occurrence. And later the teacher reported that Diego's talk out occurred at 17 intervals out of 30 total intervals. Therefore, the percentage of occurrence was 57%. This is how we use the partial interval system. Uh, time sampling form, uh, so time sampling is very similar to interval recording but you are going to use larger interval like 2 minutes, 3 minutes and then you will set the timer for 2 minutes or 3 minutes whatever uh, number you set um, and you will set the timer whenever timer goes off like every 2 minutes or 3 minutes uh, you will look up and see if the child is engaging it, uh, engaging in the behavior, the target behavior at that moment. If you see the target behavior, whatever behavior you're focusing, if you see the behavior at that moment, you will mark in the interval as occurrence. 
Now we'll think about how to collect data. So uh, once you decide what to use, like data collection system to um, monitor your students' progress, you have to collect baseline data. Baseline data means you are going to collect students' data on the objective you set without intervention. So before intervention, you want to see how the student performs the, um, the behavior, the, the objective without intervention. So you have to uh, have at least three baseline sessions to see the trend and pattern of um, baseline data. So you can have a baseline session one, you just observe your student's behavior without intervention, day two baseline, day three baseline. So you want to see the student perform the behavior without intervention in a stable way, like stably low, right? Then you introduce intervention after you see the three stable baseline data and you introduce intervention and see your behavior, your student's behavior change after you introduce the intervention. So you can compare before and after the intervention. So in research, when we have baseline and intervention phase, we call this an AB research design. You see, A means baseline phase, B means intervention phase. So in the graph, you see this researcher had five baseline data points. And move on to intervention. We don't know which intervention strategy the researcher used, but the researcher had five intervention data as well. And uh, on the left side of the graph, you see number of correct responses on reading assignment. So uh, that's the behavior, the, that's a student behavior this researcher collect data on. And if you see the first baseline data points, first day of baseline, the student made uh, two correct responses on re reading assignments, right? The next day, Baseline number two, the student had one correct respond, response. The next day, baseline three, zero. Baseline four, two. Baseline five, one. And the researcher move on to intervention phase. And the student had intervention. Again, we don't know uh, which intervention the researcher used from this graph, but uh, the researcher used uh, an intervention strategy and the student shows the correct response, uh, like five correct response on the first day of intervention, the next day six, the next day four, and then number fourth intervention, uh, seven, and the last day of intervention was five, I think, right? So that's how uh, this researcher reported the um, data on a graph. So we are going to use this type of uh, research design to collect our data uh, for our project. When you interpret graph or your data, you must use these three terminologies, level, trend, and variability. So level means the mean of the data within a condition. So it's easy. You can just report the mean of intervention phase and mean of baseline phase. So you can compare the mean between the intervention phase and inter, uh, baseline phase. Trend is a slope or pattern of change over time as seen in multiple observations. So as you connect the, the uh, data points within each phase, you will see the trend if this is positive trend, negative trend, or flat. The last one uh, is variability. Variability is about how much the data points are fluctuating within each phase. So if you see high variability, like the data points are fluctuating too much, that probably means that the data, the student's behaviors are affected by something else, not uh, by the intervention. Some, some other things are going on. So we want to see that uh, 
low variability so we want to see that the behavior is maintained at the similar level uh, within each condition so example graph here the first graph on the top uh, left side you see the mean you see the clear mean change low variability right the next graph uh, you see clear level change but uh, the trends the behavior is already increasing before you introduce the intervention so probably something is already going on before you introduce the intervention the next one uh, said no change. You see there is no level change, no uh, trend. So uh, there is no effects uh, of the uh, intervention on the behavior. The next one is, um, I like this graph. Uh, so for, uh, during baseline, the mean is low and the trend uh, is flat and then low variability. When the researcher introduced the intervention, the behavior uh, start to change gradually, right? So uh, you see a positive trend, there is mean change and then low variability. So I would say the intervention works. Second uh, row, first graph, uh, you see the trends are changing so during baseline uh, the behavior is already increasing and then uh, when you introduce the intervention the behavior start to decrease so we cannot tell if the behavior change is from the intervention or not for this graph so this is how you uh, interpret your graph Last week we talked about least to most, most least. Today we'll learn about time delay system. Time delay system includes simultaneous prompt, constant time delay, and progressive time delay. The ultimate goal with this prompting procedure is for our student to learn without errors. So by providing systematic prompting procedures, we want to decrease opportunities for errors and increase access to reinforcement. Let's talk about time delay procedure. You will provide delayed prompt in this procedure. To use this method, you need to consider two things. First, as you provide delayed prompt, your student should be able to wait for your prompt. If your student is too disruptive, you may not want to use this method. Second, to use this method, you should figure out a student's controlling prompt. Controlling prompt means a type of prompt that always works for a student. Everyone has different controlling prompt. Some students can behave okay with teacher's ver verbal direction or verbal prompt, but some children may need visual prompt to perform a behavior, or some children may need full physical prompts to perform a behavior. So those are controlling prompts. Everyone has different controlling prompts. Time delay procedures can be used for all behavior, any type of behavior. These are some examples of behaviors you can teach through time delay procedures. So the first type of time delay is called constant time delay. Once you set the target behavior, then you pick one type of prompts that always work for your student, which is controlling prompts. You will provide the prompt right after SD is given, which is zero second delay procedure. So you are going to start from zero second delay procedure and you can determine how many triers will be given at zero second delay. Many people use five trier or 10 triers of zero second delay. Then eventually you move on to delay session. So you can pick the second. Usually people use three second delay or four second delay. So let's say we pick four second delay and that will be um, 
our constant time delay procedure. So once you move on to three second or four second delay, whatever second you decide, then you are going to provide SD and then wait for three or four second and you'll provide prompt. You will always reinforce unprompted correct responses and you continue giving this delayed prompt until learning occurs. Let's take a close look at the procedures. So to use this method, you have to start from zero second delay and you provide multiple zero second delay triers. So first you provide attentional cue, usually we uh, call the child's name, like Theo, and you deliver task direction, like what to do, right? And then you provide controlling prompts right away after you say the task direction. And if your student make correct response, usually people make correct response because you provide controlling prompts right away, right? If your student make correct response, you reinforce that correct response by providing praise. However, although you provide controlling prompts, sometimes students uh, can make incorrect response. Then you provide controlling prompts right away, one more time, to correct the error. If your student make correct response, then you praise and reinforce that correct response. Cal, are you ready to learn some words? Yes. What word? Blue. Blue. What word? Yellow. Yellow. Great job, buddy. No, yellow. What word? Green. <laughs> You just wait for me to say it. <laughs> you know green. I'm proud of you, buddy. Plus, I know all the colors. You do. All right. Okay. What word? Red. Red. You know red. What word? Yellow. Yellow. You know yellow. What word? Blue. Blue. Him. Wait, there's two blues. There are, you're two right. Yellows. There are, there are. Alright, this time wait for me to say it, okay? Okay. Okay. What word? Yellow. Yellow. You know yellow! What word? Red. Red. You know red. What word? Green. <laughs> you're right, though. Good job. What word? Green. Green. You know green! What word? Red. Red. You know red. What word? Blue. blue. <laughs> I said the same You time. did. You know blue. Good job, buddy! You did awesome. So in the video example, the teacher called the child's name and provide task direction, what word, and showing that picture. And controlling prompt for this student was verbal prompts, right? So what word? Blue. So the child, uh, the teacher provide the prompts right away and student make correct response and the teacher prays. Once you deliver multiple triers or sessions at zero second delay, you move on to the delayed trier. In this example, we use three second delay. So we provide attentional cue by calling the child's name and you provide text direction. Then you wait for three second because this is delayed trier. If your student make correct response within that three second, you praise providing reinforcement. If your student does not respond at all within that three second, wait for the three second and you provide prompts again so student can make correct response. If your student make incorrect response within that three second, you provide the controlling prompts right away to correct the error so your student can make correct response. I'll say them quick. Okay, Cal. Are you ready to learn some words? Yes. All right. Remember, if you don't know the word, wait and I'll tell you. Okay? A. Okay. What word? Blue. You know blue! What word? Yellow. You know yellow! 
What word? Green. You know green! What word? Red. You know red! What word? Yellow. Great job. You know yellow. What word? Blue. You know blue. Nice job, buddy. What word? Yellow. You know yellow. What word? Red. Great job, bud. You did it. So as you see in this video example, the teacher provided attentional cue and provide task direction right away and I'll wait for three seconds. The student made correct, made correct response right after the teacher provide text direction. So the teacher provide uh, praise, right? Progressive time delay is a second type of time delay procedure. Progressive time delay is identical to constant time delay, except the delay interval is gradually increased from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3 seconds. So this is a comparison. So they both start their triers with 0 second time delay and they deliver multiple zero second time delay sessions. And in constant time delay, the researcher move from zero second to four second delay session, and they provide uh, the four, four second uh, delay triers or sessions, like multiple four second uh, delay sessions or triers. But in progressive time delay, after zero second time delay triers or sessions, the researcher move to one second time delay sessions or trier and have multiple sessions at one second time delay, and then move on to two second time mm, delay triers or sessions, and then multiple sessions or trier at two seconds, and move on to three second, four second, five second on until the child's learn that target behavior. Simultaneous prompting is the third type of time delay. Simultaneous prompting is also called zero delay because you never leave the zero second delay round. However, to identify if your student learned the behavior with zero second delay, you have to do prop often time. During prop, you provide some amount of waiting time like 5 seconds after task direction to see if your student can perform that behavior independently without prompting. After probing, if the student can perform the behavior independently, your instruction stops. But if the student is not able to independently complete the skill, you will continue triers at 0 second delay and provide multiple sessions at zero second delay and you will do another prop to see if your student can perform that skill independently. You can use these time delay procedures in small group settings or one-on-one -on -one setting. It's flexible. When you use time delay procedures, the types of data you can collect might include uh, unprompted correct response, unprompted incorrect response, prompted correct response, prompted incorrect response, or no response. So you can simply count these variables to report the data. We'll practice these time delay procedures and matching data collection methods when we meet again.